Hey, welcome. Good to see you this morning. It is the middle of August. We are at the first weekend of the fair. And I uh, want to say thanks to everybody who has served so far. If you're signed up to help serve breakfast at the fair, that's an incredible opportunity and one that we've been doing for nearly 20 years now. It's hard to believe, uh, but just a, a way to raise money for missions and have fun uh, doing that. And so thank you for serving with that. For all you joining online, just want to say uh, welcome to you. Glad to see, well, I'm not seeing you. I'm seeing a camera. You're seeing me. There's the cameraman waving behind the camera. Um, but uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. I, Pastor Austin's got an announcement that he wants to uh, share with us about something that's coming up here in the near future. Yeah, well, um, in a few weeks on September 1st, uh, we are going to encourage our church as a whole to participate in a fast, and not just a normal food fast, but particularly a digital fast. And you see it in scripture many times where there are uh, kings that will call their people into fasting. And then we see God respond to that. And uh, I have just been feeling in my spirit and I've been talking with our team uh, that we have become distracted by our phones, by uh, TVs, by computer, by different things. And so um, I'm gonna be unpacking more of this idea in a few weeks. On September 1st, I'm gonna be preaching, kicking off a new series, and I'll be unpacking kind of what this looks like. But we didn't wanna just spring it on you. Uh, when I say digital fast, you instantly have, well, I can't do this, or I can't live, or this is my work, or this is my job. And you have all of these uh, excuses and, and different things that come, and some of them are valid. Um, but I just want to encourage us between now and then to really pay attention to the Lord. And so this is one thing that we're going to be asking our people to do. When we set foot in the sanctuary, that our phones either go on airplane mode or which is for people who don't know what that is, it just means nobody can get a hold of you or we leave it in our vehicles. Now, I understand that there are parents in the room that have children one parent needs to have their phone number or phone on and available in case there's something with a child that needs that. But what would happen if everyone came in here with their full attention on the Lord? What could we see the Lord do? And not only just our attention on the Lord, but then now our eyes are open to the people around us. And so uh, we'll be unpacking more of this. We're gonna be promoting it in the next few weeks and you'll get to hear a little bit more about uh, some of the reasons behind this. But I encourage you, lean in today because Pastor Jeff has a wonderful word and uh, we're excited to continue in the book of James. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Austin. Just something to be praying about, how the Lord would guide you and lead you in that. When we would call a fast a food fast, you know, it's not that everybody's got to stop eating for a week. Everybody's got different circumstances, different situations, but we want our hearts to be together in uh, really seeing what God can do and, and challenging us uh, in our lives. This morning as we we're continuing in James, I had a feeling you were going to do that. I got a scripture coming up here, so be ready. We'll have another opportunity to do that. Um, but we love, we love the Word of God, and I love this book. James is a short, a short five-chapter book of the Bible packed with all kinds of wisdom, uh, filled with practical challenges for us living out our faith. And the title of my message this morning is very spiritual. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Talking about the tongue, how to uh, live out our faith here on this earth with our words. How many of you would say today that your mouth at some point has got you in trouble? <laughs> yeah. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not surprised. <laughs> All of us, <laughs> all of us have had the experience of saying something and wishing that we could pull those words uh, and take them back. Um, you know, every day we are saying thousands of words. Studies have, have tried to be done on this, and it's just a total estimate that we speak somewhere between 6,000 and 16,000 words a day. Um, Depending on what gender you are, you might tend to speak a little more than, than others. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that kind of a response. 
I just want you to know that in, in the document of my, of my sermon this morning, 2,973 words. I tend to go off script a little bit sometimes, so I'll add a, a few hundred to that maybe. But by the time the day's over, I will have reached the minimum 6,000 words just talking to you, and none of these words that I'm saying right now are in my script, so there you go. I wonder how many minutes 3,000 words translates to, but I've got a lot of time this morning. I'm very thankful for that. With that many words speaking in a day, there's going to be opportunity for us to say the wrong things, uh, or at least potentially, but my hope today is to challenge us in our speech, in our language, the words of our mouth that... Um, we would, would really take this to heart and really let God um, have this area of our life under his control, that we would be surrendered and submitted to him. Ready to get in the word? James chapter three. There you go. That was the part I had planned. <laughs> We're gonna have some fun this morning, but I, I know that it's gonna be challenging, and I want our hearts to be wide open to what God is speaking to us this morning. James chapter three, we're gonna read the first 12 verses. I encourage you to come back tonight. I'm gonna be following up with the last part of James chapter three that's talking about wisdom. How many of us know that uh, wisdom is something that we need, especially in the day that we live in? More than ever, and I'm thankful James talks a lot about wisdom and we're going to be looking at a lot of verses from Scripture that talks about that. But today we're looking at the first part of chapter 3. Verse 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Let me just say this. I didn't plan to expound much on this, but the whole idea of of uh, many of you wanting to be teachers. I don't know that there are many in the room today that are saying, I, I'd love to do that. Can I tell you that this part of my job is the least thing I look forward to? I was just having a conversation with someone this morning in the lobby. I, I would rather be behind the scenes, unseen, um, doing, doing things, getting dirty, working hard and sweating. Um, I would do that all day long rather than be in this, in this place uh, preaching to you today. So there is, a, there is a weight that comes with preaching, with teaching, and James says it right here. There's a lot of accountability because those who teach and those who preach are going to be held to a different standard, going to be judged more strictly. I didn't choose that. God chose that for me. I'm just saying yes to him, and uh, I'm, I'm okay. I'm comfortable this morning. I want you to know my heart's not racing. I do get butterflies often, um, but only because I know this is, this is not my talent and ability only because God has given me that opportunity. Um, and I'm just going to move on from there. That wasn't in my, num my word count either. <clears throat> if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We need God. Verse 3, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless and evil full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. In this chapter, James is zeroing in on our speech 
our language, our words. He uses the word tongue, talking about all of those things. James is is telling us, he doesn't put it in these words, but our tongue is a weapon of mass destruction. I know that that wasn't terminology in his day, but I think if James could hear that, he would say, yes, that too. What James has already said to us, we look back into James chapter 1 and 2, he's already talked about our, our tongue, our language, the things that we say. James chapter 1 verse 19, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. James 1, 26, if you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. James chapter 2, verse 12, so whatever you say, whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. And we'll see in chapter 4 next week where he says, don't speak evil against each other. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 Jesus says these words. He says, I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word that they have spoken. One day we're going to have to give an account for every useless, careless, idle word that we have spoken from our mouth. He says, listen, listen, I tell you, you can be sure of this. I promise you, I guarantee you, there's going to come a day where we're going to have to give an answer for what we've said. I hope that you've got your notes out this morning because a lot of the scripture that I'm going to share is going to be on the screen, but a lot of it isn't, and I've got a lot of scripture this morning. So make sure you got your pens and your note paper out because note takers are world changers, and that's what we want to be. I don't have to convince you this morning that the world that we live in is, is changing drastically and rapidly. In the day that we live in, truth is something that's hard to find. How do we know if something is true, if it's right, if it's the truth? There seems to be no objective standard for morality in our, in our culture. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes, in their own minds. It reminds us of a day in the book of Judges, that in those days people did whatever seemed right in their eyes, and we're living it out today. People feel free to say whatever they want, to argue and justify why they think they're right, spouting off on social media, protesting on college campuses, rioting and looting in city streets. We live in a day of moral relativism. There are seemingly no absolutes, no standard of right and wrong that we can agree on. And the day that we live in, it depends on the situation, whether it's right or wrong. It depends on the culture values, on a person's feelings. If it feels good, do it. You do you. You be you. You can be whatever you want to be. Today, tomorrow could be something different. We live in a strange, strange time, and we're struggling because things don't make sense. Are you with me this morning? To be quite honest, despite what any person or group or politician tells you, things in the world aren't getting better. But we should not lose hope because God has given us instruction how to live in times like these. James wrote this to a particular group. Actually, he wrote it to a general group of of, of believers, but he wrote it for people in such a time as, as we live in today. He's teaching us the characteristics of mature Christianity. What does it take to be a mature Christian? So far in this series, we've learned that we should be patient in times of trouble, in times of testing or trials or temptation. God is using those things to build patience in us. We've learned that we should practice the truth in how we live, that our life is a, is a witness, an example of, of, what, um, of who Christ is in our lives. And today we're talking about the power over our tongues. I want to remind you, and I think you know this, this, this morning, that our words are powerful. What we say matters. How we say what we say matters. What we don't say What we won't say matters. 
And by controlling our tongues, our lips, our mouths, our words, isn't an easy thing to do. James said it in verse two, if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Verse eight, he says, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. You might be thinking, and as, as I did, as I read this passage of Scripture several times this week, if no one can tame the tongue, then what's the point? If no one can tame the tongue, then what is the use of this? Am I ever going to make it? What James is saying to us and what we need to hear this morning is that no one can do this on their own. We need God's help. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way that we're ever going to get victory in this area is for our life, our words, our speech to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You can't solve your heart problem by just cleaning up your speech. We're going to find out how to take care of that. This morning, what I really want to do is call us all to a place of purity and holiness to be people of conviction with godly, biblical convictions about right and wrong, specifically as it relates to our words, our speech, our language. We need more people who are not afraid to take a stand for righteousness. And at the end of my message, I wanna ask us all to raise the bar in our lives in those areas. I want us to respond by opening our hearts. And if there's something that that you need to repent of this morning or there's something that's happened to you that you need to give to the Lord, I'm believing God to meet us right here at these altars. And if you've never made a choice to follow Jesus, I'm praying today that he would speak into your heart. A few scriptures that uh, talk about our speech and language, how they ought to be. These are not on the screen, so you might take notes on this. Ephesians 4, 29, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Ephesians chapter five, verse three and four. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Colossians 4, 6. Let your conversation always be full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Matthew chapter five, verse 11, Jesus said, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by, what, by the words that come out of your mouth. It's not the unkosher food or drink that goes into your body that causes problems. It's the words that come out of your mouth. Psalm 141, verse three, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Proverbs 15, 1 and 2, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge appealing, but the mouth of a fool belches out foolishness. Proverbs 16, 24, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Back in James chapter 3, he gives us six pictures comparing our tongue to several things. The first thing that he compares our tongue to is a bit in the mouth of a horse. We can make a large horse go wherever we want to because of a small bit that's in its mouth. Think of a big ship, a big ocean liner. They all have rudders, and that rudder is what guides and directs that ship where where the captain wants that ship to go. Like our tongue, a bit or a rudder has the power to direct. He also likens it to a fire. He said a tiny spark can set a whole forest on fire talks about a, a, an animal, a dangerous animal, a lion or a tiger. I was reading with my uh, grandson Barrett this week before bed one night, and I learned that cheetah is the fastest running animal on earth. Did, how many of you knew that? <laughs> you read the book? <laughs> 65 to 75 miles an hour. He can only do that for like 20 seconds and then he's, then he's got to take a break. But that's amazing. James is saying you can tame wild animals, but you can't tame the tongue. 
A fire is helpful when it's contained in the right places, in a fireplace, in a fire ring or a fire pit. It's helpful, it's useful. But outside of that, in a forest, a small spark can set the whole forest on fire. Animals can be tamed, can be very helpful, but a wild animal let loose in a room like this would be disastrous. They have the power to destroy. He likens a tongue to a water spring, and he makes this observation. Fresh water, salt water don't run out of the same spring. Bitter water, sweet water can't come out of the same, same thing. He said, listen, it's the same with your mouth. It shouldn't be right that people can at one, at one moment curse man and then on Sunday morning praise God. He said that should not be right. It's not right. Just like a fig tree doesn't bear olives and a grapevine can't produce figs. Our lips, our words will be um, appropriate to what's in our heart. You can pray, you can preach, you can lead someone to faith in Jesus, and you can also ruin a reputation. You can spout off lies. You can break someone's heart that shouldn't be right. Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. So be careful. You're spending thousands of words a day, and your words have life, and your words can have death. I think of the words that have been spoken to you, about you, around you, that have helped to make who you are and to make you how you are. Some of those are some great stories. Some of those are some very hurtful events that have taken place in our life. Many of us at some point in our lives had someone make us feel less than by their words. There is power in our words, words that are spoken to us, even decades ago, may still be having influence on our lives because once our words are spoken, there's no getting them back. It's hard to undo, it's impossible to undo the power of a sentence that is meant to cut down, to diminish, or to destroy. I challenge you this morning, let's use our words for life. The book of Proverbs gives us a lot of wisdom. It's a book of wisdom, but it gives a lot of wisdom about our words. And if I were to just read Scripture today, uh, all through the Bible, uh, Scriptures that deal with our words, there wouldn't be enough time to to read all of them this morning. So I'm pulling out a few highlights for you. And uh, this is what the book of Proverbs says. If we want to use our words in in the right way, this this gives us a lot of wisdom. Proverbs 13, 3. Those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. That's the New Living Translation. You're going to find a theme here. Proverbs 21, 23. Watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. How many of you know it's it's okay to not say anything? More times than not. Proverbs 10, 19. Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Proverbs 17, 27, a truly wise person uses few words. Ecclesiastes 5, 3, too many words make you a fool. So it's good to be on that lower end of how many words we speak in a day. No, just know that you don't have to comment on everything. There's a saying in construction. I grew up in a home with a dad who was a carpenter, so I learned some, some skills in construction. And there's a saying that says this, Measure twice, cut once. That's wisdom. How many of you found that the hard way? Okay, you had to measure three times and you still didn't get it right. (laughs) Truth and wisdom for us today is think twice, speak if you have to. James tells us, Be quick to listen and slow to speak. It's obvious to us we have two ears and one mouth. We need to do a lot more listening than speaking. We need to think before we speak. Think of this acronym, the word think. Is it truthful? Is it helpful? Is it inspirational? 
Is it necessary? Is it kind? If it doesn't meet that, if you think ahead of time and it doesn't meet that, just keep your mouth shut like the Bible says. A wise old owl lived in an oak. The more he saw, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't we all be like that bird? We need to listen. I'll share with you a, an illustration, a story of a, of a man, George Brown, heard clatter of a wheelbarrow in the front of his house, and he stepped out uh, to look at through the window, wondering who it can be, and it was his neighbor, Manly Strong, with his wheelbarrow loaded full of garbage. He turned into the yard and approached the front door. In his wheelbarrow, he had all kinds of things like rotten apples and who knows what, but that contrasted sharply with the neat, beautiful lawn and flower beds of Mr. Brown. Good morning, Mr. Brown. I brought you a load of garbage. I'm wondering where you wish to have it dumped. George Brown's eyes opened widely with surprise. Where do I wish that stuff? Have you gone crazy? Do you see any signs telling you to dump your garbage here? Manly pointed to a beautiful flower bed. There's room for it right there, he suggested. I believe that would be a good place to dump it. George Brown gasped. You dump that stuff there and you'll see what happens. Neighborly, aren't they? <laughs> would you prefer to be in the middle of the lawn, Manly asked. Say, what's the meaning of this? Mr. Brown asked. The best thing that you can do is just to get that stuff out of here. And Manly nodded. He said, I really believe this stuff should be taken to a garbage dump. But I thought if you could dump your garbage where you please, then I certainly could have the same privilege. What do you mean, George Brown asked. Well, let me refresh your memory. You'll understand what I mean. Do you remember talking yesterday afternoon with a group of boys? Before you left them, you dumped a foul story on them and also some profane language. Two of those boys are in my Sunday school class. I spend time and effort to keep their lives pure and clean, and they are as much a source of pride to me as your beautiful lawn and flower beds are to you. Yet you dumped your foul garbage on the minds of those boys. Having done so, you laughed and went away, leaving the garbage there to breed all kinds of evil thoughts and possibly evil deeds. You do not wish your flowers buried beneath piles of garbage, neither do I wish the purity of those boys spoiled by your offensive language. You could remove this stuff from your lawn, but it's a lot more difficult to remove evil thoughts which you have sown into the minds of those boys. Our words have power. Listen to my heart this morning. I'm speaking to us. We're Christians. Hopefully, followers of Jesus, the body of Christ, all of us, our lives are examples to others. We need to exercise great care with the words that we speak. And by words that I speak, I'm talking about with our fingers too. Everybody understands in the day we live in, right? You can say, oh, I never said that. Mm, did you? We are, feel so much more power to speak this way than we do this way. All of us need to exercise great care with our speech. And all of us, listen, we're all being influenced by so much that's going on around us. And we need to take great care to watch what we listen to and what we watch. The Bible has a lot to say about what we say. Like I said, we don't have time to share all of that today, but the Bible condemns lying, filthy language, swearing, cursing, quarreling, judging, gossip, backbiting, boasting, pride and arrogance, flattery, too much talking, talking without listening. But listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12. A tree is identified by its fruit. This kind of likens back to chapter two with Pastor Luke last week. If you missed his message, go, go, go watch that. A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes, he's talking to the Pharisees. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. 
A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. An evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word that you speak. The words that you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Our words are powerful. The message version of verse 37 says this, words are powerful, take them seriously. Words can be your salvation, words can be your damnation. According to these verses, our words reveal who we really are. If you ever strike up a conversation with someone, maybe you're at the fair or you're just somewhere around town, and they say something and you recognize an accent that, that's not yours, your first response may be, hey, where are you from? The accent is a dead giveaway that they're not from here. In the same way, our words are a giveaway of the condition of our heart. The Bible says the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. From the abundance of the heart, our mouths speak. Jesus' words, Luke says it this way, a good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are nev never gathered from thorn bushes and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart and an evil per person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So as we're talking about words today, we get to the heart of the matter, which is our heart. Whatever is in our heart, in our mind, it's going to come out through our words. True? This isn't, this isn't like the cheetah story. I mean, we all know this. Well, you all know about cheetahs. It's just me that catching up. But our speech reflects our heart. And the way for us to change what comes out of our mouths is what we allow into our hearts. We are accountable to God Almighty for the words that we say. We're accountable for the things that we say. Let that sink in for just a moment. That ought to make us get our hearts right so that on that day, that day of judgment, our judgment isn't condemning but congratulatory. Proverbs 4.23 this is the heart of this message. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above everything else. You're the gatekeeper of your heart. Parents, you're the gatekeeper for your children. It's challenging in the day that we live in. In my childhood, it was just a bicycle and me taking to the streets and going finding whatever piece of wood I can find to put a nail through it and nail it to another piece of wood. There was no, I mean, we weren't allowed to watch TV during the day at all. Go outside and play. Our kids don't go outside and play anymore. I would, Jeannie and I were up at my parents' house yesterday. They live in Colo, Iowa, a town of 500 people. And it was shocking, in a, in a way, as we were, we were walking out to leave, there was like five teenagers just walking down, the, walking down the middle of the street, just talking and laughing. Some of you that live in small town, you understand that. That's not normal these days in the city. You just don't see like a group of kids just walking down the street, laughing, giggling, doing stuff. They, we don't do that kind of stuff anymore. Life has changed. Kids have devices, cell phones tablets, you've got TV services, you are the gatekeeper for your children, and we need to be teaching them how to be gatekeepers for their own hearts. We're the guards, the protectors of our eyes, what we see, of our ears, what we hear, of our, of our feelings, who, and allow we, who, who we allow to have our time and our attention. I debated showing this video, but this is um, I think this tells the, the truth about the culture that we live in. It's gonna give you a statistic about movies that we watch. And um, I had several eyes look on this and I trust the people that told me they think it's okay. Is that a good setup for you? You're going, oh, what in the world are you getting ready to show us? 
I don't have to give you any more advice or set this up anymore. It'll tell the whole story. Watch this. Watch this video. You go. What shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give it. how bombarded we are by the words that are spoken in our culture. From the movies that we watch, the TV shows, the music that we listen to, and people have forever. I remember sitting on my dorm room bed having these conversations in college. They're just words. Like why we should be able to say swear words ourselves. It's just words. It's not just words. The Bible has a lot to say about our speech and the influences of the internet, social media, all that we partake in. I don't think we realize just how much those things have an opportunity to pull us away from God, not draw us toward him. We need to set boundaries, controls, protections, standards of what we watch and what we listen to. The condition of our hearts the condition of our hearts will draw us closer or push us away from God. Colossians 3.16, listen, I think more than anything, God's word is what we need to be putting in our heart. David the psalmist said, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Colossians 3.16 says that the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all its richness, fill your lives. The message says, let the word of Christ have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room to live in your lives. That's how we're going to overcome. I asked HK very last minute uh, to sing a song as I was working on my message. This song came to my mind. It's a song from many years ago that he sang in the sanctuary, in the green sanctuary across the street. And uh, this song just kind of tells the, the story of kind of where we, we are and what can happen if we don't take seriously guarding our hearts. second glance that ties your hands as darkness pulls the strings be careful little feet where you go for it's the little feet behind you that are sure to follow it's a slow fade when you 
you give yourself away It's a slow fade When black and white are turned to gray And thoughts in vain Choices are made People When you give yourself away People never crumble in a day It's a slow Compromise, the end is always near. Be careful, little lips, what you say. For empty words and promises lead broken hearts astray. Sing with me. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Ears. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Little feet. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little feet. Where you go, for the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. God has given us so much instruction of what to do, how to do, what to say, what not to say, and really our conversation about what we say 
leads us back to our heart, the condition of our heart. And that's really what, how we respond today because our ears and our eyes are gates to our heart. I'm not telling you what to watch. I, I don't have enough time to tell you what to do and what not to do. You have a copy of this. When we read it and it gets in here, it's going to guide everything that we do. What we say, what we don't say, what we won't say, right? This is not a legalistic kind of a thing. This is a heart thing. God cares about our heart. That's the Father up above looking down in love. He's saying, listen, I love you enough that I gave myself for you. I died on a cross now so that you could do whatever you want to do, watch whatever you want to watch, and listen to whatever you want to listen, go wherever you want to go. I care about you. I love you. I want the best for you, just like a parent. If you saw your 12-year-old going into a porn show, you okay with that? To a strip club? 10-year-old going into the bar just to hang out? Sounds ridiculous. But it can happen in our homes day after day. That's the world that we live in. And we as adults shouldn't be doing that either. Our response today is just simply, God, I want, I want holiness. I want righteousness. I want purity. I want people when I speak to go, hey, where are you from? That sounds like Jesus. Wouldn't that be amazing? That if somehow we could have Jesus accent in the words that we say and how we live our life. Today, I'm just going to ask that if you, I want you stand. Today, if you would say, I'm raising the bar, I need to be more conscious about what's going on in my life, what I'm allowing to influence, what I'm listening to, what I'm watching, where I'm going, what I'm saying, what I'm doing for me and my family. I'm raising the bar and I'm making a stand and I'm saying I'm all in on this. I want more righteousness, more purity, more holiness. I need my heart to be right and you coming forward isn't saying, it's you saying, I live in a sick world and I don't want the sickness to rub off on me. I need to fill my heart with the right stuff so that I can be doing the right things. Are you with me? If that's you, I just want you to come and fill the altar this morning and let's make a stand. Let's say, God, I'm all in for you and I'm gonna stand, I'm raising the bar. Here's, here's what happened when we had kids living in our home. We had a rule about what the limits were on the movies that we watch. And I had to say to my kids many times, we don't have those limits because I'm a pastor. We set those limits because we care about what we're watching. I care about you. True story? What we listen to. I'm just calling us to a place of saying, God, I need to hear your voice. God, I need your word in my life, and I'm making a commitment that I'm going to open the word more regularly than I have, that I'm going to follow the truth in a way like I've never followed the truth, that I want your, your, your words to be my words, God. Stand for righteousness, holiness, and purity. Would you just worship for a moment, and then we're going to...